uh, and participants from various uh, educational institutions, myself, Dr. Rishmi, and I will be here uh, to engage you with a one hour session. Uh, let me share my slide. So hope the slide is visible. Yes, ma'am, it's visible, ma'am. So hearty welcome, one and all, to the national level FDP on innovative teaching and learning in higher educational institutions. And the topic that I'm going to present over here is best practices in teaching and learning in HEIs. So being faculties, there is, um, uh, so when I have been offered this topic about the best practices in teaching and learning, I just imagined about the audience that I'm going to deal with. And definitely uh, the answer comes that it, it is definitely the uh, the teaching group or the faculties as such, they will be, uh, be my audience and to present before them the best practices uh, in one way or the other related to teaching is something very challenging for me because I know that I am addressing an audience who might be more experienced and more challenged than myself. So to say that this is the best practice or uh, to, uh, in, uh, to incorporate uh, one method as the best methodology is quite um, uh, difficult for me. Anyway, through this presentation, I will be sharing some of the uh, innovative uh, practices, uh, strategies and methodologies, uh, which I feel as uh, very um, appropriate in, uh, inside the classroom and as well as outside the classroom. So first, let me reflect my knowledge regarding the topic, the best practices in teaching and learning. So teaching, as we all know, it's a kind of uh, informative and resourceful sharing of knowledge since time immemorial. Uh, but teaching in the 21st century, um, it uh, prioritizes certain uh, uh, what technologies, uh, the use of certain technologies, uh, then the use of effective uh, and appropriate methodologies and strategies. We need to implement these methodologies and strategies uh, to mobilize an effective uh, learning environment. Uh, and as such, during the course of my presentation, I'll be sharing some of the transitional practices that have been implemented by the faculties of various disciplines across the globe um, to uh, with a special focus on the student-centered learning as we have moved from the teacher-centered uh, practices to the student-centered. And this is the need of the hour that we need to engage uh, the uh, students with various methodologies. Uh, and further, the National Educational Policy Framework of 2020 has also reframed the educational practices relevant in the teaching and learning environment. So altogether, we can say that these best practices or the practices in teaching and learning has, uh, has been successful in creating a dynamic and flexible learning environment, and as well as it provides um, a, a totality of learning experience. So with this, I'm taking you to uh, the next one hour session uh, related to best practices in teaching and learning. So these are the key points covered during the course and phase of my presentation. Uh, first, I will be introducing the teaching and learning process with which we are all familiar and the traditional verses to the 21st century in teaching and learning. And next comes the innovative approaches and techniques in teaching and learning. And finally, I will be giving uh, sharing some of the sample formats <clears throat> and ex uh, examples uh, of experiential learning, participatory learning, and problem solving. So this is the structure of my presentation. So to begin with, teaching and learning, uh, let me uh, borrow a quote from uh, William Arthur Ward. Teaching is more than imparting knowledge. It is inspiring change. Learning is more than absorbing facts. It is acquiring understanding. So from this definition, it is well clear that teaching is something more than merely a sharing of knowledge. It is inspiring change. How teachers, how can we uh, 
inspire or how can we impact uh, create a change among the learning audience this is very important with the traditional methods of lecturing yes we need to um, bid farewell to those traditional uh, methods of lecturing and um, uh, the teacher centered practices so nowadays learning is not merely memorization or rote learning it's not more it's something beyond the absorbing of knowledge it is acquiring understanding so to become an effective teacher uh, several the te it is mandatory that the teacher needs to switch, switch on with various methodologies because uh, and uh, because the impact that the teacher is going to create upon the students should be long lasting then only we we, we can become excellent teachers and we can uh, survive in the present day teaching scenario the teaching and learning are said to be the multifaceted phenomenon so both have an <clears throat> reciprocal impact if you are good at teaching definitely your learners will uh, like you so much they will get inspired and motivated by um, motivated from your classes and similarly you you can create a very um, harmonious learning environment to the students so if, beyond sharing of knowledge uh, teaching also imparts values and skills. Uh, it's a kind of uh, an active engagement with the learners uh, to not only to uh, enable them for their quick understanding, but also uh, equip them how to apply this knowledge in the real life scenario. So we receive knowledge uh, through study as well as through experience. So the uh, nowadays, as part of this NAC documentation and um, the various NEP framework, uh, we need we need to take students outside the classroom. We need to provide them the real life situations, which I will be um, sharing in detail. So thus teaching becomes both an art as well as science. So when you apply the unique uh, when you apply certain methodologies in your teaching uh, and when you make use of certain practices in teaching, it becomes highly scientific. And teaching is a unique uh, form of uh, <clears throat> uh, sharing experience. It becomes an art in the sense that it is unique from teacher to teacher. I cannot say that this method is only effective. So as teachers, you can... Um, accommodate or you can incorporate as many methods as possible and which one you feel it as most effective you can choose it as your best medium so teaching is both an art as well as a science and the excellence in college teaching is the prioritized need of today's education as being college teachers we need to be excellent in our teaching so the mere uh, content uh, sharing or mere knowledge in our subject alone is not effective we need to um, experiment with various adequate practices and this has these practices has go have got its own varied dimensions and i i'm sure that you might have heard the saying great teachers teach by example they always put forward um, examples or situations or experiences either from the real life situations or from their um, experience shared by others so always try to teach um, as best as possible by uh, the usage of examples or real life situations and as such we could say that the teaching finally results in the active knowledge construction there is the construction of knowledge involved behind the teaching and we are going to engage the learners through active participation so teaching and learning in 21st century, uh, the traditional approach has already become an outdated one. Uh, we need to uh, uh, we need to uh, uh, update our teaching skills. That is very important. And moreover, uh, several innovative approaches have been um, have come into effect in the uh, educational scenario. And these uh, innovative approaches really um, creates a very tough competitions among the teachers, uh, the career of teaching. And the educational landscape, as we all know, is continuously going, undergoing changes. It is an evolving educational landscape that we are going through, currently going through. And as such, we need to um, set our demands uh, as to satisfy the needs and expectations of the students. Uh, and in addition to this, we could see the uh, growth of uh, the mushroom growth of online courses offered by the various prestigious universities, um, various educational campus centers. So 
that all creates the flexibility of learning. So uh, the, the, the kind of audience that we are engaging on the real life basis inside the classrooms, they might have attended these online courses and they might have um, gained uh, the different methodologies being adopted by the teachers. So they will definitely make a comparison between those instructors and ourselves. So we uh, must never uh, fall short of their expectations. We must always update our knowledge um, in technology, um, technology oriented education, then um, we must know the different practices, how to engage the students inside the classroom. So effective actions must be taken by the teachers to facilitate this kind of learning, the student centered learning. And it has been based on the uh, the different articles that I have gone through, uh, I, I come up with a very interesting observation that several research has been conducted regarding the skills of teaching. But regarding the practices of teaching, yes, it's not, not something that is not widely uh, shared just like the skills of teaching. We have major skill requ re uh, requirements for to become a teacher. We need to qualify the national eligibility test. Uh, then we need to qualify uh, do, um, doctoral degree, but the best practices of teaching are not being actually taught to us in any way. It comes, we ourselves, we um, we uh, we try to eliminate these practices either by imitation or by uh, feeling ourselves uh, on the experimental basis. So excellence in college teaching is a continual challenge, lifelong professional challenge for the college teachers, as well as for any faculties from the teaching field. So we need to make a consensus. Uh, it's time, high time, that we need to make an agreement with that. The best practices will be adopted by each and every one of us inside the classroom. And these best practices uh, definitely contribute to the welfare of the learners as such. So classroom teaching competence becomes useful for formative evaluation as opposed to the summative evaluation. Formative evaluation is something that uh, that the teacher, uh, it's a method of evaluating the students um, immediately after the class or uh, it's just like uh, even when the class sessions are going, the teacher can pause for a few minutes and teacher can take up the, uh, undertake the quiz to know the, the level of knowledge of the students. So that is all about formative evaluation evaluation. So learning methods are compared over here, traditional versus 21st century. In the traditional method, we can see the transmission knowledge is transmitted from instructor to the students. So there will be an instructor uh, who, whose sole function is to uh, deliver the content to the students. And uh, the traditional method makes um, overuse of lectures, lecturing method, textbooks. It is uh, th that method is uh, the approach is more textbook oriented and gives uh, more importance to examinations. It is highly passive and disengaging. It never creates um, uh, a flexible atmosphere for the students and the outcome is memorization and rote learning. But when we have moved from the traditional approach to the 21st century, we have seen the primary focus on the developing skills like critical thinking, problem solving, collaboration, engaging and interactive learning experience, application of this knowledge in real life situations, and preparation of students for future careers. So when you make a comparison between these two approaches, you we, we can really place ourselves in the evolving educational scenario, how far we have moved from the traditional approach and what is our present status in the 21st century as teacher trainers or teacher educators. And now uh, I will share some of the innovative approaches in learning. So these, uh, some of most of these innovative approaches that the teacher can uh, adopt in the classroom or in the learning scenario can either be distributed individually to the students, and sometimes more than the individual distribution, the collaborative or the group work will uh, be more effective. And the uh, classrooms vary in content and goals. Yes, uh, if it is a uh, an undergraduate classroom, definitely uh, the way that we have to adopt or the methods that we have to adopt while teaching may vary uh, when we move to the postgraduate classroom. And if you are addressing the uh, MPhil research scholars or the um, uh, these uh, PhD sc uh, scholars, definitely our strategies and methodologies should be a little bit. Uh, it must be research oriented. So we need to. 
she shift these contents and goals and at the same time we have to make them engage with the reflective practice so reflect reflective practice is a kind of learning through uh, through and from the experience it is not uh, textbook oriented it is uh, it entirely depends upon the um, experience and it uh, through this experience uh, the students they gain new insight of uh, practice, uh, the insights of self, they are able to judge themselves how far they have improved in learning. And um, these approaches in learning definitely contribute to the paragon of development. So the, uh, we, we uh, adopt these methods and methodologies inside the classroom, not to hamper the development or the growth of the the, uh, the, uh, the intellectual growth of the students, but also to explore the different uh, facets of growth. And here I will be introducing different um, strategies and approaches like active learning, blended learning, personalized learning, cooperative learning, technology in, in Inside the classroom, then differentiation or diverse learning strategies. We will go one by one. Active learning. So the active learning methods definitely is an engaging approach. It makes the uh, learners very active and engaging by ways of thinking. Uh, discussions, investigating, then creating. So um, if you want to in, engage the learners in active um, learning uh, methodology, you have to give them a lot of assignments. You need to um, give them practice regarding the sh uh, polish, uh, polishing of certain skills. Then you have to give them problems, ask them to solve the problems. Uh, then um, you have to pose uh, complicated questions to them, uh, try to um, grab answers from them so this is uh, then you if they fail you can even propose solutions or uh, definitely there will be some students who will be near the solutions or who will be um, able to produce the solutions in their possible way so uh, give them some kind of motivation so that the best within the students will come outside and thus you are actually creating a flexible and dynamic environment for active learning uh, so that you can encourage them to to write you can encourage them to uh, discuss uh, so these are the different ways through which you can foster active learning next comes the blended learning also known as the hybrid learning so this in blended or hybrid learning what we have seen is the um, the use of different uh, technologies as well as the textbooks so the textbooks not only really becomes the center of blended learning instead it combines the um, educational content as well as with the technology. Uh, so um, the traditional based classroom is replaced by uh, a hybrid learning environment where the teachers, they try to share knowledge using the digital resources. So it creates, it's once again creates a very, um, uh, a very technologically, uh, technologically friendly uh, atmosphere inside the classroom, as well as it could also give them uh, you can uh, connect them with the audio experience, a visual experience. So this blended learning is very effective. Next comes the personalized learning. Personalized learning depends upon the strengths and weaknesses of the students. Each student may be different from one another. So you can focus on uh, the individual strengths and weaknesses uh, that is uh, it is very highly time consuming but sometimes if the uh, matter is very complicated and if the entire class is not able to uh, grasp uh, at least some of the students you can go for personalized learning and the next is the cooperative learning corporate and under cooperative learning uh, in the the teacher's task is to divide the class into various groups and a leader will be assigned um, so uh, the, le the leader will monitor the the group activities and based on these activities uh, they, the, uh, the, lead, uh, the group will have a discussion, uh, they will have a self-reflection um, and the teacher will, um, pro will monitor the progress of the group, will provide feedback towards the end. So in that way, cooperative learning will also become very successful. And technology in the classroom, that is another way or uh, innovative approach. So the teacher can rely on uh, PowerPoint presentations, the teacher can 
can uh, demonstrate the experiments or um, take the students to um, the real life situations through um, virtual labs, uh, then virtual experiments. So. Um, so the teacher can connect the technology while teaching and differentiation is the next important uh, approach uh, that involves diverse learning strategies the different learning strategies so learning strategies are not one and single it is not a monolithic uh, process uh, different and diverse learning strategies can be implemented at the same time the teacher can go for active learning accompanied by blended learning then um, if she feels that he he or she feels feels that the uh, personalized learning is necessary, then she can uh, go for personalized learning. So different learning strategies can be blended inside the classroom. So these are the, um, uh, some of the practices through which um, the learner retention or learner memory can be enhanced. Of course, the teacher need to present the information in an effective as well as innovative way. So innovation um, is always attractive, some, at least for some times, because uh, the innovative practice that students of this present generation, the digital natives, the so-called uh, Gen Zs, they are very much prone to the technologies, and they might be they might be more um, adaptive in using technology rather than the teachers. So we need to to um, present the thing in a very effective and innovative way and the verbal transmission and most often inside the classroom whether it be the college or the school level I, I cannot say that uh, all the students will be curious enough to uh, grasp our lecture or grasp our teaching practices so majority of the students they will be highly passive so it is to, to such a passive audience that we teachers we um, enter the classroom with a lot of expectations that we could mold and the few, uh, today tomorrow citizens is of course the our intention or any teacher's intention will be good for that matter but um if the majority remain as passive uh, not at all um engaging but more as disengaging it is the duty or the responsibility of the teacher to make them engaging and for the research has also shown that the assimilation capacity or the the uh, the attention span of the student falls off after 10 to 20 minutes of continuous lecture we know about this um, factual phenomenon so in that case how can we recall the retention or the memory capacity of the students so here i I'm providing you with various um, examples, um, instances which uh, which you can make use of in accordance with the the appropriate situation. We will begin with rhetorical questioning. So rhetorical questioning is a kind of pre-planned questions. So before entering the class, you know that uh, on which topic we are going to take class today, and so accordingly you. Uh, frames a certain set of questions within your mind. It's a pre-planned one. And you ask these questions randomly and you will collect the um, answers and you can ask the students to jot down these answers. So based on this, uh, the, the students can connect with the, uh, the portions that the teacher is going to handle. So this is a very effective way, rhetorical questioning. Asking the questions as if um, the teacher uh, is curious to know about the answer. And similarly, you have to create the, curio the curiosity, the intellectual curiosity uh, within the students. And next I, uh, is the surveys with exemplifiers. So here you will be asking the students uh, with um, various questions, various questions will be posed and you can openly ask the students uh, to come up with a um, agreement or disagreement. So those who uh, those who disagree with the topic, they can uh, give a valid explanation for that justification for that. And similarly, those who agree, uh, they can also come up with their their own justification that is creating in this way we are actually Actually, so in the initial stage, we are not actually um, show, uh, telling them that the teacher agrees or disagrees with the certain example. Instead, the teacher is just posing the question and uh, the teacher is uh, receiving uh, the, agree, uh, the justification for agreement as well as justification for disagreement. Only towards the final uh, stage, the teacher will reveal uh, which um, uh, the, the teacher's standpoint, whether the teacher agrees or disagrees. So the uh, valid justification will be provided based on the reply um, or the survey. 
the the word uh, seems to be a little bit uh, complicated, but it's the meaning is very simple. It is no, nothing other than reading and analyzing the passages in detail, and thereby creating a kind of um, a, uh, what higher order thinking skills are being promoted through this method. It's a kind of intellectual exercise, and how um, uh, through this uh, reading and uh, analyzing the passages, the students will be able to write from the um, from the situation. Then guided lecture. Guided lecture, uh, the students will never be, uh, you, the teacher must give clear-cut instruction to the students that they should not take notes when the lecture session is going on. Instead, they have to pay attention to uh, the lecture. And uh, take, for instance, uh, say, for instance, after 10 or 15 minutes, the teacher will suddenly uh, ask the one of the students to um, to summarize the lecture. So this will be the kind of um, uh, what um, uh, th this kind of knowledge must be shared or this kind of prerequisite must be shared before the class uh, actually starts so that every student will be in a position to summarize. The turn will be different. Uh, so you'll be calling different students names uh, and uh, on, on, on um, every day. And so everyone will be prepared. Hmm? They will never be allowed to take um, no instead they have to be attentive listeners then immediate mastery quiz so quiz is another way to recall the uh, subject um, being delivered in the uh, classroom then storytelling is at another effective you have you can present whether it be science or commerce or humanities so storytelling is often associated with the humanities and art subjects but still um, even I think the science teachers they can also present the uh, subject matter in the form of uh, um, just as we narrate the stories. So you can integrate the storytelling in your uh, teaching uh, practice. Then next important method is group discussion. So it is very effective and one of the most effective methods of um, teaching is group discussion. So I mean, you can engage um, a larger audience. Uh, it is a very kind of uh, the experience. They, uh, the students will come up with their own experiences and in a way the complex complicated topics can be given for group discussion. Uh, it is better not to choose the simple topics so that the, it, it will create a better understanding for the audience. Um, and it ensures more participation. The, uh, the learners will have a uh, feeling like personal connection with the context and they can exemplify the ideas as well um, here as well I'll be sharing some of the uh, effective ways to engage in uh, the audience in group discussions short readings short readings that is giving some kind of brief assignments to the class to read out in the class then individual task with review so here um, you can offer some kind of problems uh, and you can ask the students to solve the problems. Uh, so the learner, and you can allow some time. And the learners will complete this task and they can compare uh, their task with the, uh, the with their neighbors. And they will get a review um, from the neighbors um, and later only from the teacher. So it is an individual task which will be given in review, immediate review from the learners. This is how the learners they used to learn from the peer review. Then total group response. It's a kind of... Um, um, the the first the teachers will assign a situation or a um, a kind of question to the particular the entire class will be divided into various groups and based on these groups each group will be provided with a uh, the same question will be provided to each group but the response from the different groups will be recorded by the teacher and uh, finally um, on the basis of the authenticity of the response the teacher will finalize and um, maybe some groups will fail to meet the expectations but some group will definitely they will be in align with the um, the exact answer or the exact solution so in that way it's from the total group response that the teacher comes to a conclusion then visual studies so visual studies are very effective um, method and for this uh, to enhance the visual studies we have this photographic essays video programs then personally made video recordings all the these um, instances and examples bring into the classroom depictions the complexities of the concepts.
then first person experience uh, for this uh, we can introduce the autobiographies then biographies oral histories then diaries audio video recordings uh, then memoirs so all these uh, first person instances of first person experience bridge the gap between personal experience and the content under study Next, we have self-assessment questionnaires. Um, well, the questionnaires will be prepared by the uh, teacher. And these questionnaires will be uh, distributed to the students so as to assess their knowledge, the self-comprehension uh, of the subject matter. Then case studies. Um, so a problem, the case studies, usually we conduct case studies when to pose a particular problem and to find a solution to the problem. So this can be um, conducted by individuals to, uh, to distributed to the individual students or as, uh, as we used to do it earlier. We can divide the class into various groups Anyway, uh, through uh, case studies, uh, several uh, dimensions and uh, uh, perspectives of the problem will be explored and very um, realistic uh, solutions will be um, offered by the students. And next we have the role play. The role play also um, enhances the students to uh, perform the real life uh, situations by enacting the real problem situations and then discussing their enactments so through this they can um, they can uh, not only uh, sympathize but also they can empathize they can understand the emotions feelings and attitudes values and strategies of the other group then thoughtful questions so it is a very effective way to formulate the questions because it's highly engaging and it boosts confidence within the students. So the right kinds, it's always said that the right kinds of questions opens the door to student participation. So the teacher must always encourage the students by asking the right questions at the right time so that the students should never have an inhibition that once in a while if we come up with the questions, they will be very um, reluctant to to answer the questions so we need to um, make it as a practice uh, to pose questions at the right moment of time and we need to also make them understand about the current uh, situation or the current problem so learners attention should always be related to the current uh, situation then socratic questions that is the right kind of questions so the answers so answers for certain questions uh, will never be directly um, uh, contributed by the teacher instead the answers will be um, will be uh, formulated based on the discussion given to the class so this is for this the teacher needs to ask several questions before reaching the answer so such questions are said to be socratic questions and here in this slide i have provided several tutorial questions like description these are all the different uh, different things that you can practice inside the classroom description for under description you can ask the question what did you see what happened or what is the difference between then we, next we have the function uh, what is the function of what is the purpose of then procedure how was this done then what is the next step how do you do this then possibility what else could how could we then prediction what will happen or how will it um, look like? Then justification, uh, based on what evidence or based on what proof you are able to summarize. Then rational, why? What is the reason for that? Then generalization, uh, what could you generalize from these events? Or how could you relate with this kind of generalization? Then definition, what does this concept mean? And finally, you have to give them a wait time. That is, they need at least 15 um, seconds of processing time. You. Uh, as teachers, you sh shouldn't expect the students to respond immediately, though they may be such students in every classroom. You have to give um, enough time and space for them to reflect about these topics, and then you can um, uh, evaluate them. It's a kind of formative evaluation. So reflective responses to learner contributions. So this is a kind of, so teachers are great motivators and great inspirers. So it is uh, our sole responsibility that we need to take the responses from the learners and these responses uh, positively uh, contribute to their uh, 
personality as well. So it's a very effective way to establish communication by reflective listening. Uh, and it also facilitates self-discovery and self-appropriated learning. So three uh, methods and strategies have been uh, put forward here uh, to enhance the reflective responses to learner contributions. First one is paraphrase. So paraphrase is a kind of uh, just um, we literally use the word paraphrase to um, be um, that is taking the uh, exact uh, literal translation of the uh, passage or uh, converting it in um, without changing the meaning. So here uh, the paraphrase in the reflective response uh, response context it applies uh, to the both the intellectual aspects as well as the emotional aspects of the learner contributions. So the, the teacher uh, who is uh, just um, controlling the class, uh, the teacher, even though we talk about the student-centered learning environment, the teacher, everything takes place under the monitorship of the teacher. And the teacher often uh, gives a hint to the students. And the underlying message is that the learner will come up with his own um, imagination, his own way of understanding. So what the teacher do is that instead of taking that ideas or sentences, the teacher will paraphrase what he tries to say. So this is in many way that boosts the confidence of the students. So in the first level, the, the learners will be given the chance to paraphrase uh, the the concept or the aspect but the teacher also adds something to his comments making it little more uh, simplifier so this is a method of paraphrasing next is leading query on learners topic so this is a query it's a kind of question based on the learners topic so here we have this, um, sometimes the students will have the, uh, they will face the difficulty that they do not understand this particular topic. So uh, in that, in such a situation, the, the professor or the teacher can come up with a um, query, uh, with a question on the learner's topic, on which topic you face the difficulty. So the, the, the teacher will, should have the, um, uh, the, the, the capacity to simplify the topic and all the queries should be taken positively. Uh, we should try to um, explain um, to our level best. Next is the parallel personal comment. Without changing the topic or without um, debating the topic, you, we have to connect with the current feelings. Uh, or the past experience so that uh, we will get the comment will be made by the learner regarding the classroom uh, session and um, the parallel comment will be made by the teacher. So here we have two personal co two comments. One is the comment made by the learner and the other parallel comment will be given by the teacher. That is parallel personal comment on a particular session. So these are these three methods definitely boost the reflection responses to the learner contributions and rewarding learner participation so these are the effective ways to support the learner actions with encouraging positives avoid praise so definitely the teacher can praise the students inside the classroom but sometimes um, uh, they can misjudge the teachers to be partial towards certain students. So uh, the specific by pinpointing the names of the students, such praises can be avoided to a, a greater level anyway. Um, we can offer praise when it is really praiseworthy. And an objective description is more recommendable rather than the subjective description. In that sense, again, uh, the subjective has been pointing the names of students. We need to value uh, the action or we need to value the answer being uh, contributed by the student rather than the name of the student. Of course, you can talk to them in person. You can reward them. You can say good words to them. The narration is another kind of uh, uh, engaging way to for the learners to participate. It's just like narration usually begin with uh, now you are um, having uh, an issue that needs to be discussed in detail. Uh, so you are trying to fit the, um, uh, the thing into narration. So this is a kind of uh, just uh, with, by seeing uh, the emotional response of this 
happens, the teacher come to realize that something is going in uh, in the mind of the student and a detailed explanation is necessary. Then self-talk. So self-talk is also known as subjective talk. Uh, so these questions um, will be asked uh, to the students based on their own personal experience. Hmm? So uh, they will be given to share their own personal reflections. The non-verbal um, these are the gestures of excitement and success. Then personal feelings as participants. So uh, you have to describe your um, emotional reactions as a participant learner. The teacher um, should also become as a member of the uh, participation. Then as a member of the group, uh, discussing uh, and expressing uh, the personal feelings. Then active learning strategies. As it is clearly stated in the beginning that learning is a constructing process. It's not just like we constructing, it is a constructing process. We are constructing the various aspects of knowledge, skills and values together. And it also fosters an active and constructive participation of the learners. So for learning to become a constructive process, we need an active and constructive participation from the students. Uh, so here there is a learning strategy titled construction spiral. In the construction spiral, we have um, uh, three important steps are involved uh, it's just like a learning cycle each individual writes down their thoughts and it is it will be shared in a small groups of three and everyone uh, each group will be asked to compile the answer on the board in front of the whole class and if they fail to articulate the second problem is posed to them so in this way each individual will get a, a chance to participate so the individual participation um, under the framework of a group that is the construction spiral and active learning strategies can be can become effective uh, through um, a various uh, learning uh, dimensions and various learning um, experiences here i will be introducing various um, learning uh, strategies with, with which most of you are familiar with and uh, this is uh, actually these uh, strategies build a kind of self participation so the self participation of the students <clears throat> that is very important uh, the teacher merely stands as a facilitator motivator um, an influential figure in the classroom and the rest of the activities the major activities will be shared to the students on individual as well as on group basis they will be subjected to various learning strategies and in this way the teacher can generate the ideas encourage creativity involvement of the whole group so sometimes the teacher talks about the mightiest point that is the weakest point uh, then the clearest or the the, um, the most um, the, the strength uh, strength wise point then they will be given um, for a presentation just like for one minute paper they will be asked to write a one minute paper presentation so including all the points so in this way we can make this active learning strategy very effective beginning with round around each person in turn expresses their opinion on a particular topic and um, next comes the other uh, individuals or other students uh, turn then fish bowl fish bowl is again and uh, that is uh, it's a kind of group discussion um, so each one each group will come up with their own uh, findings they will be asked to write it on a piece of paper and the nga papers will be collected on a bowl um, so uh, and the teacher will get a chance to analyze that um, the contributions made by the group in connection with the particular aspects then brainstorming of ideas uh, so the alternative possibilities can be elicited uh, only with the help of brainstorm uh, so on the basis of this brainstorm the teacher can make judgments um, it, uh, it, so new ideas can be generated then uh, then creativity can be encouraged the involvement of the whole group will be made possible through brainstorming uh, then writing in class uh, it can be the focus questions then in class journals uh, then reading summaries then class essays so all this improve the learning of the subject matter then it can also next we have this concept models then simulation and games 
so uh, simulation and games is more related to the practice um, with unfamiliar and complex situations uh, so it can provide uh, so the teacher can provide well structured rules and uh, relationships for these games so it can last for one hour or if interested in the such simulation and games can be extended to more than um, um, hours then peer teaching yes assigning the teacher roles among the students so the the, the smart uh, students will be uh, given the status of uh, teachers they will teach the weaker students so uh, it's another excellent way of uh, imparting knowledge then question pairs Question pairs, the learners prepare for the class uh, by reading an assignment, uh, generating questions focused on the major points or issues raised. And at the next, the meeting pairs are randomly assigned. Um, so they provide uh, corrective feedback if necessary. Then learning cells. Each learner um, reads different selections, then reach the essence of the material uh, to the randomly assigned uh, partner. Uh, that is all about learning cells. Next, we have the cooperative group assignments. The five key elements are involved, positive interdependence. So cooperation is possible only through interdependence. Um, then individual accountability or individual responsibility, group processing social skills, face-to-face -face interaction. These are the five key elements of cooperative group assignments. And the team member teaching can, uh, in fact, provide the team effectiveness design, knowledge outcomes, skill outcomes, and attitude outcomes. Next, we have here the double loop feedback. So what is this double loop feedback? Double loop feedback is uh, being practiced by the teachers uh, for the correct performance. Through this double loop feedback, errors and deficiencies can be avoided. So the word itself um, mean, uh, be, starts with the term double. So the feedback is provided. Usually teachers provide feedback uh, about the students but in the double loop feedback the initial feedback will be provided by the peer group and later by the teacher so double feedbacks will be um, credited to each student each student will get double feedback one by the fellow learner and the other by the teacher so it is a method of providing correctiveness in accordance with the learner's continued engagement um, as if to acquire competence and self-confidence so if the learner themselves uh, come forward as a as, pro, as a provider of feedback, yes, they will be more, um, uh, it will be uh, the, the learner, the fellow learner will take it uh, very seriously because they all belong to the same age group. So in the step one, the objective description of physical reality will be provided. The step two, the culturally accepted meaning will be gathered. And step three is the real feedback uh, processing uh, stage where the judgments based on this uh, personal reality, judgments and personal realities will be provided that is double loop feedback which can be very effective inside the classroom then climate setting so uh, it is very necessary that uh, one must look into um, uh, take into account about the climate that is uh, even the territory of the classroom offers a very uh, a very good climate, a favorable climate of collaboration, support, openness, and humanity. So we need to meet the learners' needs for physical comfort and accessibility. Uh, so the, the learners should be provided with um, the basic uh, rules of uh, comfort and accessibility. And then there are negotiable and non-negotiable areas inside the classroom, such as uh, attendance of the students, participation, timeliness, uh, similarly the seating arrangements, format TV evaluations, learning means. So we need to provide all these things. Uh, an excellent teacher uh, should give a clear-cut instructions regarding these requirements necessary for the entire term or the entire semester at the beginning of the class itself. And the instructor's role should be clarified. And we also need to clarify the learner's roles as they are the members of the learning community. And how can we foster learner self-responsibility? We need to plan and evaluate the learn learning. And we need to engage learners in mutual planning. We need to diagnose the needs for learning. We need to formulate the learning objectives. We need to evaluate their learning. So the um, learner self-responsibility begins with planning 
then diagnosing, then the teachers formulate the learning objectivities, and finally, the teachers engage in evaluation process. Next, the important techniques for teaching and learning in higher educational institutions. So here comes the core of the uh, topic. Uh, we will begin with experiential learning, collaborative learning, adaptive learning, gamification, and flipped learning. To begin with experiential learning, so experiential learning is the learning through direct experience. So in, instead of textbooks and by merely sitting inside the four walls of the classroom, the students need to be taken outside in the for, for their field trip, um, internship or um, project. Uh, so internship, field work and service learning projects come under experiential learning. So through this experiential learning, they, they can be engaged with the real world situations. They can apply their knowledge and skills in the practical setting or otherwise inside the classroom, they will be exposed to the merely theoretical aspects of teaching uh, or learning and here they will uh, bridge the gap between theory and practice they can connect the academic concepts to the real world situations uh, so in this way experiential learning um, provide the students a better opportunity to understand the relevance of the learning to develop the skills that can be applied in the future careers as well Next comes the collaborative learning. It's a kind of approach that uh, encourages the students, that encourages the students to work together in groups to solve problems and complete the projects. It promotes teamwork, communication skills. It fosters sense of community within the classroom. It's an opportunity to learn from the peers. It gain new insights and develop broader understanding of the course material. And next we have this adaptive learning. And for this, uh, we use technology. To personalize the learning experience, we provide customized content and feedback. We allow students to learn at their own pace. Uh, so the, the strengths and weaknesses of the students can be easily um, judged by the teachers. And accordingly, the, this, those students who need more attention, that is a kind of uh, personalized learning experience can be provided gamification so we can use the game elements such as giving points reward points badges leaderboards to motivate and engage the students it's very effective in promoting um, student engagement in uh, difficult subjects it can also increase student motivation uh, and students are more likely to be invested in the educational process um, if it is accompanied by gamification and their active role in learning will be um, there will be no compromise regarding this then flipped learning. Uh, so flipped learning is a kind of practice which involves reversing the traditional classroom model. Students watch lectures, they complete readings outside the class, then they come to the class to engage in the hands-on activities. It's more personalized and interactive learning environment. Um, they engage with the course materials in a more meaningful way. And finally, they receive feedback and support, not only from the peers, but also from their instructors. Then research-based education, um, so it's an inquiry-based learning. That is a learning process which engages the students with the real-life situations through exploring um, higher-level questioning. So uh, through problem solving, then experiential learning. Uh, so uh, we have this research cycle um, with the formulating a question, then overview of the research, defining question, planning the research activities, clarifying methods and methodologies. Then we can undertake investigation, we can analyze, we can interpret and consider the results, then report and presentation of results. These are the different steps involved in the research-based education. Then critical thinking, it begins with problem solving. So here under problem solving, we analyze the literary, resource, uh, literary sources, we interpret the research results, we critically evaluate the articles. And here as well, we can see the different types of um, examples like spider web model. It's just like having a nice spider with uh, various uh, strings. Uh, just like the core concept will be placed at the center and all the connecting aspects will be placed at the strings. Then Oxford style debo uh, debating refers to um, that, that is divide, that is agreement and disagreement. As we could see in the uh, common debate, one group will agree and one other group will disagree. 
Then scaffolding method where teacher acts as a uh, facilitator. The teacher provides the hints, uh, the teacher supplies the resources, all the rest of the things will be uh, performed independently by the students. The teacher is merely a scaffolder. The teacher merely um, instructs the class. Then Socratic seminar, the seminar that comes up or that motivates uh, the highest participation of the students in the way of asking questions. Then we can we have this question formulation technique, reciprocal teaching, then Bloom's twist. So Bloom's twist refers to the starting the lessons from the lower level of thinking and gradually we can increase it. So these are the different aspects of critical thinking. So here I will be providing some of the examples of experiential learning, Skywatch program, which can be implemented by the physics department and film workshop uh, by the mass communication department, then communication skill enrichment program by uh, the language departments, then medicinal garden and vermicompost lamp by the biology botany department, then aquarium and biocompost by the um, department of aquaculture, then educational tools by MPA, uh, um, then uh, PPA, MPA, um, BVOC uh, students, interior gardens, um, earned by loan, then the collection of plastic waste and e-waste collection, news and wall magazines. These are all the examples, very effective examples of experiential learning where the students will be exposed to different life, real life situations. Then participatory learning, um, teachers forum, the, te the students themselves um, become teachers and they address for instance the postgraduate students they um, they will be given the opportunity to teach for the undergraduate levels then electoral literacy club in the college um, becoming an effective platform to know about the election procedures then thesis presentation and open defense by research scholars uh, yes uh, so if uh, if there is a research department in the college we can make the postgraduate students as the um, uh, the participants of this thesis presentation through which they they will know come to know uh, that what, what is this thesis presentation then how will a, uh, how, how will a research scholar face the open defense then quiz club debate clubs arts club journal clubs invited talks by the academic experts then different um, courses being offered uh, through the soim platform like in ptl add-on courses certificate courses on various subjects then learning management systems like moodle google classroom so all these are the different instances of participatory learning and next we have this problem solving so here uh, we have this uh, innovation and entrepreneurship development center iedc then innovation software apps library works and assignments which all promote problem solving i will have uh, display a very short video related to uh, problem solving
So this is, these are my concluding observations that the educational landscape continues to evolve. It keeps on changing. And as educators, we need to open ourselves to new approaches um, and we have to continue and adapt the different aspects and phases of teaching practices to meet the changing needs of the students. And we should always be adaptive to the changes and we have to move along with the changes. Thank you. That's all about my presentation.